Good afternoon and welcome. I am Dan Varson, your host for the sixth AutoTalk session. AutoTalk is a member service benefit of AIADA. To ensure you can see us live today, please make sure and click on the participants button located in the top right hand side of the web page. Today's program is sponsored by our affinity partner, CNA National. We are honored to have Mr. Jim Press with us today. Jim is currently president of RML Automotive and past president of Toyota Motor Sales USA. Jim spent over 30 years with Toyota. Jim, welcome to today's program. Thank you, Dan, I appreciate it. It's an honor uh, and a pleasure. One of the things I miss most about my old job is getting to visit with our dealers and all of our business partners uh, and their a source of inspiration and energy that I uh, have a chance now to tap into. And I appreciate your joining. I, I got a list of some of the folks that are uh, with us. I know uh, just to shout out Mike Mike Bevan, if you're there, it says hi. Steve Gates, Kevin Canal. You know, we're talking about the future. Kevin can help us better than anybody else on the technologies. Uh, he's from Toyota, he takes care of future uh, aspirations. Shawa Lamb. Uh, Robert Register shows that he showed up. He's our dealer partner in Fayetteville, Tennessee. Robert, thanks for joining, but don't spend a lot of time here. You need to take care of your customers. Don Thornton from Tulsa, a bunch of folks from from the past. And I'm, I'm sorry I, I, I'm a minute or two late. I'm kind of excited right now. The truck just pulled in with our first Tacoma, uh, the 2016 Tacoma, and I had to go out and sit in it and touch it and smell it. It's one of my favorite vehicles, and there's nothing like a new vehicle like that. Uh, it's fantastic. I didn't get to go to the dealer meeting, so this is the first time I got a chance to see it, and I can't wait to drive it. Anyway, I, thank you, Dan. I appreciate it, and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions you have. Absolutely, Jim. And let me remind our audience again to please click on the participant button on the top right side of your page to make sure that you can get all the video features. Let's start off with kind of an easy question here, Jim. After so many years on the, the OEM side or the manufacturer side of the business, how are you enjoying the retail side? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, now I know what I always wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, <laughs> the retail business is, well, I started there and my family uh, were in dealerships. I began cleaning parts uh, bins when I was 12 years old to stay out of the way. And it was always thought that I'd come back into into one of the stores, and I never did. I spent 37 years at Toyota, then I spent some time at Chrysler. So it took me a while to get smart, but I finally got to where I want to be. Uh, the the retail business is the real connection between the marketplace and the customer. I love doing. I love selling cars. I love doing business, uh, and it it helps me understand a lot better the things that I did right and wrong in my prior jobs. Probably should have done this before I did that. I could have been better. You know, the other thing, uh, Dan, I was thinking that I, in the past, I, whenever I've seen a group of dealers, I've always apologized for some of the things I did because now I know what it's like to be on the receiving end as a dealer uh, from the OEMs. If some of them have different levels of communications and alignment. Uh, I love working with the OEMs. I love working with the people. You know, in the retail world, you can help develop people, their careers, their aspirations, young people, uh, and that's something that's really important, especially with the young, very talented dealers uh, that we can bring into the business. So I'm having a ball. Uh, we're making a lot of friends, and uh, at, at the same time, I think you're creating a future for a lot of people. I love the retail side of the business. Uh, and uh, recommend it to all of my friends for the factory that I consider it. That's great, Jim. like hearing that. Hey, Jim, last month was a, another strong sales month. Um, you and I were talking about it actually before the program started with a SAR close to 17.2 million. Uh, do you say anything on the horizon that might interrupt this, or do you expect that pace to continue? Uh, any threats that you envision for next year? Not really. I mean, uh, we've had uh, six years of growth, which is somewhat unprecedented. Probably going to touch close to a record this year. 
uh, which is something that signifies we've achieved a milestone of recovery and we've gone then some, it's not just pent up demand, but it's embedded demand. And when you look at the, the economic factors, uh, employment, the interest rates, the fuel cost, uh, the production capacity from the manufacturers, uh, all of the indicators that may uh, lead us to where the SAR is going to wind up, there's nothing in my mind that's going to take us off track. So I think the industry volume demand is going to be significant uh, as we go forward and interest rates try to start to move up a little bit. Uh, we have a, another year of high, high volume. And we may see some impact on grosses. Uh, the manufacturers continue to increase capacity for production. They've been adding dealers. Uh, they're all trying to take advantage of the growing market. And you know, you know, Dan, it's kind of interesting. When you go around and you add up, you talk to all the OEMs and you ask them what their sales forecast is for next year, uh, it's about 25 million total industry. Everyone's going to increase share in a growing market. Not going to happen. And when the market quits growing, uh, actually you, you get a little bit of a level off. So we're using this as a signpost of continue in the short term to try and reap what the market has. But the long term, we recognize that there's going to be some flattening of profit growth. And so we're using this time to look at our expense structures, our fixed expense structures, our, our embedded costs, uh, and our strategic plans to make sure that we're prepared for the, not for the next year, for the next three to five year period, which is right now the focus of our attention. Jim, a lot of brands uh, in the marketplace, I, I know what, probably 30, 35 plus different brands out there today. Um, do you think there's too many in the market, or is there room for all of them, and which brands are you bullish on? Well, first of all, there's room for all the brands, uh, and they're also beginning to specialize in segments of, of demographics and appeals to certain markets, you know, like Subaru. Uh, it's a great brand, uh, somewhat of a niche. It's growing, but I think you're going to see more of that. The, the consolidation that's going to occur uh, on the OEM side isn't brands, it's the manufacturers. Uh, the cost of developing products, the uh, economies of scale, the scope uh, that they have to cover, it's becoming quite capital intensive for the returns that the dealers, that the manufacturers have versus what the dealers have. Uh, so I think that there may be some consolidation at the OEM level. But the brand distribution, I think, will continue to grow. Plus, you're going to get uh, some new players that, that aren't here. We're going to have some new Asian brands that are going to make their way uh, to the U.S. market. You know, heck, this is the, the most lucrative market in the world in terms of profit contribution and per vehicle sold, and also in terms of the, the number of vehicles per household. What a great country America is. So uh, we've got uh, high ownership. It's growing. Multiple car owners, uh, multiple car households growing. So there's lots of room for brands. There's lots of room for, uh, for increased opportunity. Manufacturers will come in here. The problem is, of course, that you're going to have more competition, a more mature market. It's going to be more crowded. It's going to be more difficult for each brand to make sure that they're well known, recognized, that their image is established, and that they get their fair share. So it's not going to be uh, as easy a market. But it's definitely going to be competitive. So uh, I think there's room for all of them. Uh, what brands uh, that I'm bullish on? Well, you know, I I, uh, I admit fully of being prejudiced, but uh, the company <laughs> that has the greatest resource uh, bed, the, the best R&D, manufacturing footprint, DNA, uh, is, of course, in my mind, Toyota, Lexus. And it's driven also by the fact that it's part of a, a company that's the connection to the family. Uh, and if you look at the family-related companies that are making investments, not just based on this is what our, our profit target is and how do we squeeze that out of the market, but more going to the market and asking the market itself and learning what needs are in the customers' minds. I know Toyota's driving their cars around the world to interview customers and know what cars to be building in the next five or ten years. Uh, Ford is another family uh, 
handheld company, uh, BMW is one, Hyundai is one, uh, that over the long term from today forward, there's going to be ups and downs, but those companies are going to continue to perform, in my mind, their brands will continue to perform very well. And there's some up-and-coming brands. Uh, you know, I mentioned Subaru, which is a strong brand. In fact, it reminds me somewhat of, uh, of Toyota 40 years ago when we, we started uh, building the brand with the baby boomers. Subaru has followed a lot of that playbook, and though they're really attaching themselves to the millennials, the young customers, the X's and Y's, and so it, they, they can extend that brand out, they can build on that. I think it's a, a great company in the future. They've shown restraint, uh, and boy, their products are bulletproof. Nissan is another brand that uh, I think the, the drive of the company, the, the strategic direction, the development of products, the upgrading of quality, the upgrading of appeal of their products and focus on manufacturing. Uh, Nissan has a great footprint in low-cost countries. Uh, Volkswagen does too. The companies that have a low-cost company presence are going to have a big advantage in the future. Uh, yeah, Infinity is one that with their relationship with, uh, with Mercedes and the uh, drive from Nissan uh, is a, a, a potential. And Nissan and Infiniti uh, and Subaru to some extent are undervalued brands right now where you might be able to pick them up. Uh, the, 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 the luxury makes, uh, of course, Mercedes, uh, BMW, Audi, uh, and I include JLR, Jaguar Land Rover in a, in a brand, and that's a brand that's undervalued. Uh, they've got a lot of growth potential, tremendous products, really strong brand equity, uh, especially with the Land Rover and the way extending the, the Jaguar brand into that is, is strong. So uh, I think there's a number of great brands, but to be honest, uh, the best brand you have is the one you have now, uh, and you'll make it successful if you want to. It doesn't really uh, doesn't matter. And it also depends on your investment strategy. Are you in, you're in looking for brands based on uh, acquisition to grow a platform, uh, to make an investment and see returns? Are you looking for cash on cash returns? Are you looking for accretion of value? Uh, those factors have to be considered into which brands you want to pursue. Uh, and I think in that case, the ones you want to pursue are those that have the highest quality and the highest capital capacity at the manufacturing level, uh, those are the ones that will endure long term. Right. Hey, Jim, let's let's switch gears just a little bit on product. Boy, uh, Toyota was a leader with with hybrids, certainly in volume, and we're seeing now electric cars. We're seeing vehicles that uh, supposedly drive themselves. Uh, how do you think the products are going to evolve over the next five years? I mean, there's been rapid change there in that area. Well, you know, stop and think about the, the, the issues that we face as an industry globally. Uh, we're, building, we're building and selling 100,000 cars a day on Earth. We're adding that to the load on the highways, on the uh, environment, the resources, there's a, uh, the safety on the roads. There are a lot of factors now uh, with the kind of density we're looking at, the growth of, uh, of automobiles in emerging markets that assure that if we don't do something as an industry with our products, that we don't really have a sustainable industry. And so I think a lot of the technology that you're beginning to see in the marketplace 15 or 20 years ago, uh, most of the manufacturers, especially Toyota, had the foresight uh, to recognize the investment needed in alternative powertrains uh, and in, in a significant improvement in the footprint, the carbon footprint, as well as uh, the Earth's footprint uh, for our vehicles. So uh, the, the Prius uh, it was like 96 or 97. I remember going with the dealer council to see the first Prius, and everybody looked at it and said, oh, my gosh, uh, you know, how many of those are you going to sell? We thought maybe we could sell maybe 100 or boldly 150 a month uh, at the beginning, but recognizing that that was sort of the Model T of what was going to become the commonplace car. In the next couple of, uh, of decades, you're, you're not only going to see uh, some type of electrification combined with IC engines to make them more efficient. So you've got hybrids, you've got 
uh, you've got battery electrics, you've got plug-in electrics, you've got uh, onboard electric generator vehicles, you've got all these, these combinations. Uh, the fuel cell, in my mind, is really the long, long-term solution, uh, and it's going to be compete, competing with batteries. They have different uses. Uh, over the road, uh, highway, long range, short range. And then you've also got this phenomena now where car sharing and the use of software technology is making it possible for people to use cars in very different ways. Uh, when all this confluence coming together is going to have technology of powertrains, technology of production, uh, distribution, and then you talked about the self-driving cars, which is definitely uh, in the future. About 80% of the technology on a self-driving car is available today on the new E-Class. So the ability for us to put a car together uh, for self-driving is there. And if you think about the time that you're using commuting, if that could be used in a productive way or a social way, the improvement in safety, the compaction of the density of vehicles on, on the roads that will significantly improve our lives, allow the sustainability for our industry, and allow us to give mobility to people in emerging markets and in crowded cities for years to come. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, you know, the Tesla is a great example of new technology, new players coming into the industry, and the way they interface the, uh, the operation of the car, uh, the appeal of the car. Uh, the, I know John Kraftcheck just uh, joined Google. Uh, you stop and think about the impact of a solid uh, auto exec like that, a guy that came up through Ford product, product planning, working on self-driving cars with Google. I can't wait. I just wish I was like 40 years younger because this next era is going to be fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Jim, let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit and move over to the dealer side of the equation. Um, I know there's been a lot of observation. It seems like the pace has picked up a bit on dealer consolidation. Uh, do you expect that to continue and certainly the pace to pick up on consolidation? Yes, I do. I think, I think it's inevitable for a couple of reasons. One of them is the structural cost in running a dealership continue to increase. Uh, the cost of running businesses in general continue to increase. The, uh, the, the old days of a mom and pop store with a cigar box as a cash register, regulations, exposure, liabilities, competition, and everything else it puts more pressure on the need to grow the, our car dealerships into, in, into pretty professional businesses. When you think of uh, building that out in scale, uh, the, the large consolidation gives you economies of scale, uh, you can share best practices, you've got, uh, you've got access to services you wouldn't normally have, uh, much better return on investment. And so what that's fueling is investors that have not been in the auto industry now taking a look at it and saying, well, it's pretty good returns there, you know, 15, 20% cash on cash if you want. I mean, that's not, especially in today's, I get I think an eighth of a percent or something in the bank. Uh, it's, it's pretty compelling. So you've got uh, an interest of the investors that want to put money to work. You've got a need uh, in the dealer body. Not everybody. And, there are, and consolidation doesn't mean these giant uh, public companies with uh, hundreds of stores. Uh, consolidation makes sense for a family group that wants to grow a platform. Uh, for example, um, you know, in a, in a, in a market uh, like uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, auto Nation may not go in there, but we can be the Auto Nation of the Bentonville, Arkansas. And it gives you that kind of economy scale, uh, presence, brand image uh, in the market that you, would, that you couldn't have as an individual operator. So I think consolidation will occur at a number of different levels, but it's, it's inevitable. And it's also a great way for very successful dealers who have built their businesses or generationally built their businesses who may not be in a position to, uh, to have someone inherit from them. And in that case, uh, it's, it's one of the best ways of exit possible. Uh, and at the same token, it's not the only one. So I, I, I do think the pace will continue and, uh, you know, we, we hope to, con to uh, uh, participate in it. Great. 
Hey, uh, Jim, moving uh, into the fixed stops area, and this is an area near and dear to my heart, having come up through that many years ago, with the new car warranties going longer and the popularity, it seems like, of CPO and the CPO volumes continue to grow. Uh, do you see any downward pressure on the fixed stops part of the business or side of the business, I guess? Uh, is this going to affect you know, the service lengths and the profitability associated with them. Oh, I, I think just the opposite. Uh, a couple things there. First of all, uh, as, the, as, there, as the industry continues to evolve, the opportunity for us to generate profit and really serve customers' needs in new car sales uh, isn't what it has been. It's going to continue in, this, in the range of the lower lower margins. And so, uh, service is our lifeblood. It's our creating loyalty, our customers for life, uh, the uh, linking our dealerships with our customers, satisfying their needs. And you talk about the business we're in, a service business, we're solving problems that customers have. And uh, not only do they have the need for maintenance and maintaining a, a very complex car, but when things don't work right, it, you, don't, you can't go, you know, when I started out in our family Chevrolet store, we used to uh, gap the spark plugs with a matchbook cover. It was 35 thousandths of an inch. You, you don't do any of that anymore. It's all, nobody can do it yourself the way you used to. So I think that the need and demand, especially as we increase the volume uh, for fixed operations, is going to continue to go up. And the other thing I'll mention is that you are, you're right about the uh, length of the new car warranties, but uh, unfortunately some of the manufacturers still haven't got that quality thing figured out. And our shops are plenty full uh, with opportunities. As, uh, you think of uh, the, the focus now on recalls uh, and the need for recalls to be performed at uh, certified dealers. Uh, and uh, that's an unprecedented number of uh, service visits. So I think just the opposite, accessorization, customization of the cars, uh, used vehicle volume is going to continue. We need to be able to capture as much of that business as we can, certified pre-owned. That's all service internal as well as uh, you know, creating new customers. So uh, uh, we're, we're just fully committed to that really being, in my mind, the front end is the service and parts business. Uh, back in the old days, they used to say that was the back end, but not in my mind anymore at all. Right, right. Hey, Jim, let's... Uh shift gears a little bit here more about uh, the front end of the business, I guess, as uh, uh, what we would all call the front end. Uh, shopping habits, the new car buyer. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of dependency among the, uh, the, the younger buyers today, the millennials especially, dependency upon technology. Uh, how is your organization addressing this younger auto shopper, and how do you retain that demographic? The loyalty perspective—they're not nearly as loyal as they used to be. Well, uh, a couple things. First of all, uh, I, I'm not so sure they're not as loyal. They haven't formed loyalty yet, uh, and maybe the way they will relate a loyalty factor may be different than what has been or what their parents were like. Uh, but there's, there's these are—they're not that different from their parents when they grow up. You know, do you ever look in the mirror and say, gosh, I've become my father or I've become my mother? I mean, it, it happens. So, uh, but, but you have to be in tune uh, with the different generations. Actually, you know, as I said, I was excited because I came in here and I'd just seen the Tacoma. It's funny you say that. The cu it was a customer. We had customers waiting when the truck pulled in, by the way. Uh, and there was a young lady looking at the Tacoma. Uh, and I, I said, hi. How did you find out about it? How did you, it's almost like you knew it was coming in here. She said it was on my Facebook page. Yeah. Uh, and then she, she knew about the truck. She knew about the interior. She knew about the models. Um, and she, uh, she's, she likes dirt bike riding. Uh, and so the reason I say that is that the, the new customers' habits for media are different from their, their parents. And so the further down the funnel when they come in, uh, more and more of our appointments, as opposed to showroom traffic, are driven by the internet, by our outreach for the BDC, through social and digital media. Uh, in fact, probably a majority of our visits 
are coming from the non-traditional uh, digital side, uh, and I think that's fantastic because you know more about the customer. Uh, you, it's much easier for you to have qualified uh, to understand what their needs are, have a car waiting to show them, or three cars waiting to show them. You can anticipate what they need. Uh, and it, it's also important to know the customer that, from that standpoint, you know more about them when they come in. A key that we found is that our associates in our stores have to be the customer. Customers like, you're always going to have salespeople. I don't, you, these programs they showed, I know, I heard uh, Toyota had a, program like a vending machine where you put this in and the car pops out. There's some there's some customers for that and I'm sure that there's going to be the brave future. But the fact of the matter is persuasion, contact, dependability, uh, trust are all engendered through the interaction with a customer and a, a buyer. And so you've got to have people that know this technology that can embrace these customers and that's the way they're going to grow the business. Great. Hey, Jim, kind of complementing that subject, as digital retailing and marketing continue to grow, how is your organization balancing traditional advertising and promotion with the new digital landscape? Um, I've heard NADA maybe recommend a 50-50 split in budgets, but how are you guys addressing that? Well, it depends. It's, first of all, our stores are run by our dealer partners. Uh, and they know the markets that they're in. Uh, in Fayetteville, Tennessee, is quite different than Dallas, Texas. Uh, and so the, the call on that uh, from a standpoint of resources is the best tools we can give to our dealer partners to understand the sources, uh, the alternatives, the better. Uh, and at the same time, uh, they have freedom to move, and we have moved. We've seen a huge shift from traditional media uh, to uh, much more digital or, out, or even our out, outbound uh, uh, business development center calls. Uh, that's more about collecting information. You're driving visits to the internet. You're driving visits to the phone uh, as opposed to showroom visits because the customer, again, is further down the funnel. Right. And it's an important way that the dealers can create their own unique brand equity and why buys that will make them different from the others in the in the marketplace. So uh, we're putting a lot of a lot of emphasis with a separate digital marketing agency in a lot of cases from what the old uh, the old media agency relationship used to be. Great. Hey Jim, um, I think there was some big news earlier this year. Uh, really shook the one one segment of our industry, and that was when Cox purchased Dealer Track for several billion dollars. Uh, what's the impact of the shrinking number of service providers to the dealers? Do you see that as a threat? One provider perhaps uh, holding too much power over a, a, a dealer group? Not really. In fact, I think there's some synergies there and maybe it's the opposite too. Uh, that the, the dealer group, and that's part of the consolidation, you have more purchasing power, uh, can affect compromise or assistance out of these large consolidated service providers. Uh, they, they're buying, they're investors right now, they're buying a lot of these, uh, uh, companies. They haven't really figured out how to integrate them or how they all fit. They will. Uh, and I think that as a, a, as a user, as a customer, we can demand solutions that fit our needs, our individual needs as a dealership. Too many of these these, these uh, providers in the past have a, a one size kind of fits all where it works at dealer A and I, I think it works for you and I'll tell you why. It puts it the other way around. These are my problems as a dealer. This is where the competition is. This is what the marketplace scenario is. Uh, I need solutions and I need connected solutions so uh, that goes all the way from the new car sale all the way through to the auction when they start uh, selling uh, used cars and, and buying used cars. So uh, they they can and I think they'll get their act together and there'll be more of them. So I, I think it's a, a really good benefit uh, to the dealers if we, it's not going to be the personal relationship kind of, well, this guy's a good friend, he's done it in the past. It's going to be more professional for us and we need that. 
Hey, Jim, kind of going full circle here. I, I know we started with the OEM push, and this is kind of a question that uh, bridges both the OEM and the dealer. Um, there appears to be a push for a lot of new facility enhancements and requirements. Um, you and I both coming out of the factory side, I think we can relate to that being from the factory side. Uh, mm -hmm. How is your group balancing the cost-benefit analysis with that requested requirement uh, between furniture, brick and mortar, uh, service tools, on and on. When I was a young uh, young district uh, manager in, at Ford, uh, and uh, Fritz Hitchcock was one of my first dealers, he oh, took yeah. me upstairs. He took me upstairs to his, his parts uh, mezzanine to show me all of the the parts displays that he had to buy for the factory and where he stored them. <laughs> so I've always kind of appreciated the need for the dealers to uh, make that selection. But and this is also a case where I have to say I'm sorry to a number of dealers for right. what behavior may have been in the past. But in all seriousness, uh, we look at this as it's our decision. It's our investment. Uh, we look at the factory requirements as a decision point that we can decide whether it's something we need to do or not. We need to discuss with them why it may not be necessary or why not now. Uh, there has to be a dollars and cents business case. Uh, the, the manufacturers should do that when they come out to sell these programs to show you what the common sense is. But if it makes no sense to make an investment that has uh, a negative business impact only for vanity, or only to check off that uh, that they did what I said. Uh, so I think you need to be uh, careful. Uh, and I I have some great friends that have plans that are yellow, and they've been passed through generationally from one district manager to another to another. Uh, and uh, while it used to on the factory side, it, I used to recognize that. Now I see the value of it sometimes. Not to dis, not to to not be transparent but to balance the needs because ultimately the impact of those investments are ours and our shareholders. And we've, we've got a responsibility to assure that we make the right moves. And it's most important for the customers. Uh, and and uh, so we have standards in our dealerships that require that all of them would, would pass any needs that any, any requirements a customer may have. That's the ultimate, makes money and satisfies the brand image or whatever the, the OEM wants, uh, that's that's also something we look at, but it's not the driver. Right. Hey, Jim, uh, our final question today, before we close it up, um, do you anticipate the current incentive, uh, incentive levels to stay pretty consistent uh, throughout 2016, or do you see maybe uh, some softening in the market and uh, a requirement for increased incentives? Great question. Uh, I wish I had a crystal ball, but the answer to that is going to depend on the manufacturer, uh, their production plan versus what the market demand turns out to be. Uh, a lot of all those plans are set uh, for the beginning of the year, and it's all based on assumptions that are made on this is what the transaction prices are going to be, this is what the volume is for these models in that segment in terms of what the demand should be and you come up with a, a plan that would allocate incentives. As you get into the year and you see what the real situation is, that there may not be so much demand, there may be weather, events, uh, interest rates, or whatever it is, or that model may have some competition, uh, then you begin to fine tune to match the short-term production requirements with what demand really is. Uh, so I, I, I I'm, I guess I'm, I'm answering your question in a way that the factors that will create incentives, in my mind, will not only continue, but will get stronger because the market definitely is not going to keep growing at this speed. Capacity of production is increasing. A number of new models are coming out. Older models are going to need incentives, and they're going to continue. Uh, and uh, I know a lot, of, a lot of companies want to husband the incentives. They're worried about their brand equity, and they're worried about their pocketbooks. But the fact of the matter is the aggressive companies that are going after the market, and, and the, the difference in product quality is much more similar today than it was before, 
and you've got players like Mercedes and BMW that are now down market, the level of competition is different. The aggressive companies that are going to grow are the ones that are going to be using money to spend it in the right way. Uh, and that's to reward the dealers that are doing the job and to make the cars more affordable and to adjust the transaction prices to that sweet spot where you can maintain volume. Uh, so, the, yes, the incentives will continue. They won't be on everything, but they'll be on the right products at the right time from the manufacturers that, that are going to grow and expand their market share. Well, Jim, I really want to thank you for your time this afternoon. We're, uh, we're a little bit over, and I, I want to thank you for your time this morning as well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Press uh, was on this morning at 10 a.m. and again this afternoon uh, at 4. Jim, we can't thank you enough for your time and your support of AIADA. We really, really appreciate it. I also want to say thanks to our affinity partner that sponsored uh, this afternoon's session, CNA National. Please join, please join us for upcoming Auto Talk programming. Uh, that's always on the third Tuesday of every month. Our next program will be October the 20th at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. AIADA is a dealer-run organization based out of Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, we represent your voice here in Washington, D.C., at the federal agencies, in front of Congress, and also with the administration. Please plan on attending one of our upcoming events. We'll be at NADA again this year with our annual luncheon following, uh, and then we'll also have the Automotive Summit following that. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you again October the 20th. Thank you very much.